Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, this is a faith and lifestyle channel and occasionally we have career conversations with very interesting people, case in point. Um, my name is Balesam Klimbi. Uh, thank you to everybody who subscribed to the channel. If you haven't, why haven't you? It's literally free, like you don't have an excuse. Today, I'm very excited because we've got a very special guest, another one, um, as promised, and we're going to be hearing more on her career and leadership journey, and I'm sure that you're going to enjoy the conversation. Miss Pranisha Naidu, welcome. Hello, Pelesa. <laughs> How are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm okay. Uh, very excited to have you here. Um, Me too. I'm can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, well, and I'm, who you are? Uh, well, I'm Pranisha, <laughs> Pranisha Naidu, um, born and raised KZN. Well, I'm 36 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm a finance executive within mm. Consumer Healthcare. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm a board member within Consumer Healthcare. I've been in FMCG for the last Guys. 15 years. So, yeah, it's been quite, quite fascinating. I'm an avid traveler. Yes. When I'm being an average person and not commuting <laughs> I, and not spending a lot of time in the airports, I love reading. I have a little pet. Call Sammy, yes, yes. I love him. Uh, I'm a family person and I do yes. a lot of community work as well. So I like to give it back to people. And then I mentor amazing people like Yay. you and uh, just amazing guys and girls yeah. as well. So a big passion point for me. Cool. Uh, very excited to have you here. So guys, uh, just a bit of background. Um, you can obviously see that I'm tapping into my existing network. I met Pranisha through work, uh, her previous employer, my current employer. So yeah, that seems to be the trend with these videos. Um, and I think, yes, I was partnering the function that she was working in. She had moved out of finance um, into the sales organization. And then we sort of like just formed a friendship. Um, and later on, she became my boss. She moved back into the finance organization and became my boss. And we've still maintained a relationship post her departure. Uh, yes, a very awesome vibes, committed person, uh, super smart um, and career savvy. Is that a word? Yes. Little. Very career driven, <laughs> career driven. Um, so I've learned a lot from her, uh, which is why we've continue to maintain the relationship and the friendship, which is what it has evolved into. So I'm just going to be asking her a few questions um, about her career journey, and I'm hoping that we can learn something from it. Um, so tell us from when you left school. Wow, yes. when I left school. That's a, that's a long time. <laughs> Thankfully, not talking about primary school and no, secondary school. No, uh, yeah. metric. <laughs> so, look, I, I'm born and raised near Bank. It's a, it's a very small town within Durban. So went to school there. I actually wanted to study the arts. Really? Very, very funny, right? <laughs> so, I was very interested in, in you know, going, performing arts, um, you don't strike me as the type. <laughs> yeah, I was very interested in screenplays, directing movies at that point in time, probably because I spent so much time watching TV myself as mm. a young kid. But um, that actually was my first choice. Mm. I wanted to do that. But, yeah, I mean, what people don't really realize is that when you, when you come from a non-privileged background, those kind of options are not an option for yeah, you. Yeah. You've got a limited amount of money, yeah. and you've got to spend that money in the right spaces. Yeah. So I did what every other wanting to make money kid does. Um, and I said, okay, second option, finance. Yeah. That's how I landed in finance, right? So mm. whenever somebody asked me, wow, you like so fit for the profession, um, like I often say, actually, your your that wasn't choice. even my choice, actually. <laughs> mm. It's just something I work very hard at to, yeah. to make it you know, yeah. my first kind of choice. But yeah, uh, funny story, I want to study the arts. Mm. So did my university at UKZN mm -hmm. uh, become, uh, become finance? Um, and I'm a finance professional, of course. Yeah. But um, I finished there at UKZN, and then, surprise, surprise, I was unemployed. Hey. The, it's the reality of mm. almost every single South African graduate, right? Mm. It's a sad reality of our country. It's unbelievable the level of smart people who cannot find jobs in this country. It yeah. is really a heartbreaking circumstance. But I found myself as one of those, right? Mm. Um, so stayed at home a couple of months, started doing a lot of interviews. Uh, I really tried different things. Eh? At that point in my life, I was like, the single biggest objection uh, 
ambition, shall I say, mm. was literally to find a job and yeah. make money. Yeah. Because in reality, most of us just want to make money. You know, yeah. you want to be able to pay back school bills. You may want to further your pro, your uh, qualification, which is what I want to do. I want to study honors after that. But, you know, you you got to find a job for that. Yeah. yeah. But the problem is that nobody's willing to take you on because you, you don't have, have experience. experience. They're asking for, you know, 10 years of experience, but you're only 22. Mm. So there I was unemployed. And, you know, funny story is that, um, you know, this, uh, some of the jobs that I did during that time, you know, mm. to try and get a, a foot in as well. You know, once I spent the whole day selling a car, car can of polish at a garage really so they said you know do you want to come and be uh, you know trained to be a sales rep i said okay i'm unemployed let me try maybe it's uh, yeah. you know a foot in the door yeah so literally i spent the whole day selling car polish shining people's cars telling yes. them that hey this is a product it mm. looks amazing mm. i'll try it on your car mm. i'll shine a, par- a part of your car would you buy it yeah so yeah. I mean, you have to be prepared to do those things. Yeah. That's the thing, right? Yeah. When you are starting out, you know, life is not easy. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult. Mm. Um, so, I mean, fast forward to that. Finally, an agency calls, contacts me. Mm. So a recruitment agency, mm. right? Were you like on the market for an agency um, or they just reached out via LinkedIn? Or? No, no, absolutely not. I mm. mean, like 14 years ago, LinkedIn wasn't even a thing. Mm. I wish it was, you know, <laughs> I would be all over that. But mm. unfortunately, there was no LinkedIn at that point in time. You literally had to, you had to, you had to apply manually. I used to sit in the internet cafes. I didn't have internet or computer at home, mm. but I would sit every day in the internet cafe. Doing I was so popular in that cafe yeah. that I would go in the morning, sit there like literally most of the day, um, applying online because mm. you have to do these. You know, people make you fill in, fill in literally your whole life history on nice. a, on an online application for uh, for for jobs. Mm. They still do that. Unfortunately, some people who have not moved on with mm. the technology. But that's how I would spend most of those months that I was actually unemployed. And I probably would have sent out, I don't know, thousands of applications in reality. And most people who have been unemployed will say, tell you the same, right? Yeah. You've got to, you know, it's like a, a one-hit wonder in a sense. Mm. Yeah? Whatever job you get after being unemployed for a period of time, that is what will happen. You, yeah. You'll, unfortunately, you know, one of them may take, but you've got to send out maybe 5,000 applications for that one to find, make a turnaround in something. Because you're competing against, like, for what, 50,000 yeah. other yeah. graduates at yeah. the same time. So this agency then contacts me, and, and they were like, we have a job. Mm-hmm. It's not a permanent job. Yeah. It's a POD clerk. I'll explain what that is in a moment. <laughs> And it's only for a month. Yeah. Yo, that's so brief. Yes. So I was like, uh, a POD clerk basically, I didn't realize fully at the time, mm. but a POD clerk basically means that back then there used to be a lot of filing cabinets yeah. with proof of deliveries. That's what mm. it stands for in a filing cabinet. And to cal- collect the cash for the organization, for the company, you actually then go have to go and find this this mm. this document mm. and you got to then be able to submit that to the customer to get the money yeah, yeah that's what it meant so yeah. basically i would be going through files boxes etc to be mm. able to find pod's proof of deliveries in order to get paid for the company yeah. get the funds so at that point i just said yes <laughs> anything will do anything would do so yeah. they said okay i'm interested uh, I'll come for the come for the interview. So it turned out to be Unilever, okay. Place's current <laughs> employer, my previous employer. Um, and and funny story about Unilever actually. To take one back, while in university, I actually applied for the graduate program. Mm. So I was one of those millions of children. I would say that probably thousands actually that that apply for that graduate program because it's probably one of the best graduate programs in yeah. the country. Yeah. So go through all of the selection rounds, and literally there were probably three selections rounds, so very, mm. very uh, tough. You know, mm. we're just coming out of university, first year, green eye. But um, what happened is that they rejected me through that process, mm. yeah? So it was one of those reject moments, and it was a super sad moment. I always remember it because, again, I was in an internet cafe. I always remember the moment. It was a rainy day outside. Oh, no. And I was expecting it to come through. I, I had full faith, you know, it, it would That come you're going to get in. But and as a result, I had, you know, turned down, so to speak, other graduate uh, mm. uh, opportunities at that point in time mm. where it required me to move out of the city, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because Unilever was here in Durban, it kind of made sense. I wanted to be homebound for that period of time. 
So fast track now to this moment where I'm entering the Unilever office to interview for this job. And the guy that's interviewing me is a much, much older gentleman, mm. um, a much older, very strict guy as well, right? And you could see that, I mean, one, I come with no experience, yeah. right? Other than the waitressing experience I had previously or these kind of like mm. car polish call center type experience. But nothing relevant, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Nothing relevant. Certainly not for like finance job, right? Yeah. Um, but I really wanted to get a, a foot in the door. Mm. And I, I told you, I was... Okay, so you were sharing about how um, you walked into this interview. Um, you knew that you didn't have the relevant kind of experience, um, but you were desperate for the job, so to speak. So yeah. what happened? Yeah, so I basically told him that I would work for free. Yeah, no, Don't ever do that. Like, Literally, please, guys. Never do that. Mm. I think you can see the circumstances, obviously, mm. that prompted that kind of thinking. Yeah. But for you know, a young graduate, unemployed graduate who desperately needs a job, that seemed like the best thing at that point in time that to show that you know, I was really interested mm. and I would be willing to work really, really hard. Mm. Thankfully, he never took me up on that offer. Yeah, <laughs> that, imagine. That, that really helped because I was uh, kind of wondering at the back of my head, how would I afford, that the, gonna work? How would I afford <laughs> the bus fees and all those kind of things as well? But it's so sad, sorry to cut you, but um, now that you mentioned that um, so many people had applied for the graduate program, obviously, that you had initially applied for, but we know the situation in South Africa, right, with the high unemployment. Um, that's how desperate it is mm. for many people. Um, maybe even without having had the job already, your family is already looking to you for financial support. Mm. Um, and here you are, you being offered a one-month job, yeah. um, or that's all that's available to apply for. Um, so many people could be subject to exploitation even. Mm. Um, imagine if he had taken you up on that offer. I know. Then what would have happened? <laughs> um, so it's quite unfortunate, um, but we're not there. Yeah, thankfully we're not there. You know, it's, it's a, it's, it was a great organization with the yeah. right values as well. So, you know, that uh, ordinarily that could have been a very compromising circumstance yeah. Yeah. had it not been the type of organization that it was. But look, fast track, he hired me. Um, it was a grueling month, obviously, but I literally stepped all in. Mm. You know mm. that I think that's probably one of the the secrets of success. My success, you mm. know, in a short space of time, people often look at me, um, you know, as an exec director, very young. You know, um, they kind of ask me what is the what is the secret, you know, to being able to progress so young yeah. in your career. And that, that's actually it. You have to be willing to, to go harder. Yeah, you, know? yeah. you may not be the smartest. You don't have to be. You don't yeah. need to be the summa cum laude person. Mm -hmm. you, know? uh, you don't need to be the person that's coming out of all of the fantastic academic results, the most qualified. You don't need to be that person at all, right? Mm -hmm. You have to go be able to w be willing to go a little bit farther mm -hmm. than the other people yeah yeah, yeah. you got to go yeah. there because that's actually you find that's that what's going to set that's you that's going to set you apart yeah. you know the work ethic the style of uh, being able to you know learn things faster putting a lot more efforts in in your output those kind of things and for me that's what i did you know yeah. one could argue how does a you know pod proof of delivery paper girl for <laughs> lack of other words move into exec director with a lot of hard work mm. let's be honest right it's a mm. lot of hard work mm. but um you know i i had an amazing trajectory at unilever yeah, i i seized every opportunity uh whatever opportunity came to me i worked really hard for it as well but i think the you know the crux of the message always is that you can't really uh, you can't really judge from the beginning yeah. your, what your story is yeah. going to be yeah. like. Yeah. I never had any ambition. I will be very frank and honest. I never had any ambition. You wanted ambition. to be an artist. <laughs> I had no ambition at all to be a finance, you know, head of finance one day. That mm. was not my ambition. Mm. It probably wasn't even my ambition until a couple of years ago, really, mm. uh, when I thought, actually, hey, it could it's happen. possible. Yeah, yeah, it's possible for me. Because, I mean, growing up in that environment, you never see people... Like, yeah. you never see people like us. Mm. You don't. Mm. I mean, you're not, you're not breaking bread, so to speak, with the CEOs. Yeah. You know, you yeah. don't have those kind of people yeah. in your communities. Yeah. You know, people are hardworking. They're humble. They are amazing people. But they're not doing the type of jobs that we yeah. now get an opportunity to do. Right? Yeah. I never had that experience. You don't even 
you don't even have the dream no like, it's not never even it's not a possibility. possibility it's not a thought it's it's amazing you mm. know it's like such a mental block yeah and that's a problem with uh, you know people that come children that come from our kind of communities in mm. a way right mm. indian black communities that come from an, uh, from a non privileged kind of background you yeah. know where you you're sitting in a private a public school kind of domain you're sitting there with 50 other kids uh, everybody you know you kind of competing against each other but there's a bit of averageness in a sense yeah. because nobody really is motivated to do more right they see what they see in front of them and that becomes unfortunately for most children that becomes their then adulthood as well yeah. you know they that's the the community that they live in the, the benchmark was low that. exactly that's what you aspire they don't towards. see beyond that yeah The benefit of moving into a good organization is that it helps you with that. Yeah. yeah? It helps you see beyond. I yeah. was instantaneously transported into this organization even though I was in a very low paying job. Mm. Um, you know, uh, probably unseen across thousands of other other, you know, employee personnel as well to to an extent of time. Uh it it opened opened my own mind actually yeah, i saw whoa. these people and There's i was like wow mm. you you can actually there is a space you know i saw people who had uh, achieved to an extent yeah mm. and i thought actually wow this is an interesting space for me but even then i mean early days i still didn't consider it i thought you know, it's, it's very them. very different it's yeah. them not my path i was just like i whatever i do i keep the job right yeah. <laughs> so i was still in that mindset <laughs> Um, but let's say I attempted for a year mm. at Unilever. Mm. I I did So your one month turned into a year. A year, exactly. Gosh. That's amazing, right? Mm. So I mean, mm. one month turned into a year, but a year of temping where if any moment they if, could cancel your contract. Oh, I remember nice. uh, like three months in, they, I actually got a notification the contract was canceled. Really? And I still remember the toilet to date. that I sat and I cried in. Oh my god. And then I came out and continued to work. Mm. That's like the story uh, story of every corporate, right? There was a lot of these kind of toilets yeah. in the corporate. <laughs> <laughs> where you go to just have a moment. Exactly, and where you, you have a moment. <laughs> But I mean, you have uh, to have that your contract canceled at that mm. point in time was the most harshest thing for me. I couldn't see beyond it. It was the most emotional moment I can ever remember in my corporate life actually mm. because it meant so much, you mm. know. and it meant so much to everybody around me you know yeah. my family etc as well so it was it was really gut wrenching moment but then they came back to say actually we want to keep you yeah. uh, we have another uh, kind of opportunity outside of just the collection of PODs for you so do you, are you interested to just keep on i said yes i will do <laughs> it you'll take you know? anything <laughs> i will take anything but look a year in mm. they converted me to permanent i finally got mm. a permanent job um so that's good mm. and then i continued to work as a debtor's clock at that point in time for a certain set segment of customers for another year. Yeah. But by then I could see that you know all of this kind of working working quickly but working smartly mm. meant that I was collecting more payments than anybody else in the in the function from a customer that generally pays you one time a month I was getting by then two payments at mm. least for them a mid month and a month end kind of payment. So you know it was going very well but yeah. i could see that i was struggling to be stimulated through mm. that process i i did i had finished my honors at, at that point as well so at least i managed my ambition of continuing my studies when i started work yeah but um i needed something else mm. yeah and that's when really I, i was very grateful i had a line manager a shout out to nerisha maharaj <laughs> <laughs> she was a line manager and later became you know a good friend as well but mm. um she she motivated to somebody else um within the organization for for one of the um one of the category roles hmm, so fancy exactly <laughs> so at that point in time that would have been a role by the way hmm. if i had originally got the graduate pro- that's post, what she would have gone into i would have gone into it so well, here right was time. i exactly here was i two years now behind hmm. entering the job that I would have got mm. um had I you know uh, got my foot in at that point in time but no stress for me yeah, honestly yeah you're still in it was all, it was a I was I was very happy to be there you know um my colleagues my peers said uh, truly smart people some of the best people that I've ever met mm. in my life um have walked through those walls with me as well and walked those floors with me 
but um, yeah, I think that that kind of story of how you start yeah. is so important, yeah. you know. And yeah. the fact that I then worked from category manager, uh, category accountant to category manager. Mm. I worked on the Africa portfolio. Mm. I did a lot of work with Nigeria mm. <laughs> at that point in time, and a few other markets within Africa. Mm. And then I I went across to to Singapore. Okay, so you were sharing about um, the feeling in your family during the time yeah. where you were in between jobs. Yeah. So I was sharing that actually they are they're extremely supportive people. So mm. my mom, dad, my sister, extremely, extremely supportive. I think they were more concerned during that time of unemployment. You can imagine, um, you know, coming from the type of families you come from, the level of investment, yeah. right? Uh, even then, you know, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, the level of investment to put somebody through university mm. is significant. It's a lot. It's a lot. Especially if you have more than one child as well. Mm. I mean... In this case, I was very lucky. My, you know, my mom, dad, they really put every single cent that yeah, they say behind, behind studies. That's mm. all. That was the ambition. So I was very grateful for that. And actually, that was the, the guilt factor for me, mm. in a sense, because I felt so, so required now to actually show, to move, to move that into something meaningful, to actually make a return from it. Yeah. So using finance. <laughs> <laughs> but... I felt in that way that I can't let what they have done. They have, I mean, I saw them struggling. My mom worked seven days in a week in a shop. She was a, a shop assistant as a cashier. My dad worked so hard, literally taking a bus in the morning, bus in the afternoon. But, you know, life was very, very tough. Mm. In a way, we grew up in a very tough environment as well because every cent had to be saved for, for, this, for this moment where my sister and I would eventually go to u- university. Yeah. But the view is now, okay, I have this. Now I've spent all this money. Mm. How do I turn it into something? It, yeah. That was literally the motivation. And it was the motivation for years to ensure that I don't, I don't let them down in a sense yeah. that I've been able to do something with the, with the years in which they have compromised mm. and sacrificed, mm. literally. Mm. So they, they've never put that pressure on me. It's probably a pressure that I put on myself. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people would tell yeah. me that. <laughs> but, but at the s- end of the day, I think, you know, if you come from that space, you've got to be able to give it back, you know, in yeah. a way. So, yeah, look, I mean, they, they're super supportive. They were very supportive during that time. But it, it required, obviously, quite a transition for us as well, as a family, during that time as well. Yeah, no, certainly. Mm. Um, so back to doing uh, roles across markets uh, and then physically crossing the border. Yeah. Uh, Actually, you asked me a question before that, which is about comparison, right? Mm. You said, what is, a, what is it like, you know? That with comp- your peers. Yeah, the peers, all the, the people that you had also gone to university with, but also now... The, the set of people that had come in to the organization as the grads, right? Mm. The, I used to call them the cool kids. They came in through the front door while I came in through <laughs> the back door. Mm. And I, uh, it was a foot in the door, shall I say. But um, it was challenging. Mm. And, that, and that nobody talks to you about that, actually. The comparison, mm. you know, that you have to make with yourself and your peers. Mm. And for a long time, actually, there's a lot of feelings of insecurity, I would mm. say, right? And that's what also fueled the, the kind of working ethic, the style, because I felt that I was consistently I behind. Myself, yeah. What is the, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I felt I was consistently behind, you know, I'd already two years behind the, the guy that came in uh, at, the, at the step I was meant to come in. Mm. I have to now prove myself so much more. Yeah. But the thing is, and I... I would share this with everybody, actually, in your journey. You cannot compare yourself to somebody else. You can't. Yeah. Whatever it is, we tend to make comparisons as women, from woman to woman, mm. um, and the sh- same age group as well, the same di- diversity, racial diversity. You can't do that because, actually, when you look at somebody, you don't know where they have come from. Yeah. They may Everybody's the, path is different. Absolutely. They may be exactly the same age as you, you mm. know. They could, you know, look very similar to you as well. Come from the same, maybe the same area even as you, right? The same yeah. city as you. Yeah. But your path has been so different, you yeah. know. And you got to appreciate some, in some cases, it's really not about the position the person is, but how many roadblocks and milestones they've mm. had to pass in order to get mm. there. You know, some people, I was lucky. Mm. I had somebody pay for my education. Mm. Many kids in university, you have to pay back your own loans. Yeah. Imagine that pressure, right? Yeah. You've got all the loans yeah. and uh, you now need to pay that back. You don't yeah. have a job. Yeah. So 
And I think, you know, sometimes that's where corporate kind of gets it wrong as well. Because mm. they very straight line compare. Co- yeah. Performance management, etc. They put you all in a group and say, oh, she's performing very well. He's not performing so mm. well. But what they what don't... What it takes to show up exactly, person to person is exactly. very different. Exactly. It never takes into account how much it took for him to show up to that position yeah. that he is now in. It yeah. may be two notches below, mm. but he's there, you yeah. know, and he's making yeah. it work. Yeah. And that's what we as young professionals need to keep in mind. You know, yeah. a lot of people still feel that insecurity. My peers earning 10 times more than I am. <laughs> they're driving a Merc. <laughs> they're driving a Merc, you know. They're staying in a fancy place mm. or... Um, they're living in Amshlanga mm. versus wherever. Mm. And that kind of pressure, don't put it on yourself. It's yeah. not worth it. There were yeah. many years that I kind of felt that pressure as well, which spurred me. Mm. I, I'm, I'm the type of person that under stress, etc. it spurs me on to do more, yeah. Yeah, take on more, yeah. uh, be able to show something productive for that. But not many people are like yeah. that. Yeah? Yeah. It, it can, can get, get you down. It can become a really internal block, which years later you struggle with self-esteem issues, etc. So it's a very dangerous space. But the comparison, I think sometimes the co- corporates don't quite get it right, is to actually understand where the person has come from. Yeah. If you understand that, you will be able to appreciate the person's journey so much more. Yeah. I don't feel that, uh, frankly, titles, I don't put a lot of success on titles. Mm. The fact that I have a fancy title says nothing because tomorrow if I lose that title, then what? Then I'm back to being Pranisha, yeah. which I'm very happy to be Pranisha. And yeah. you've got to feel that, you know. Yeah. The challenge is when you get very comfortable being a title, being a thing, mm. that you use, lose your humanness in yeah. a way. As well. And it fuels that comparison to say, oh, the next person is already exactly. so much further. Yeah. What am I doing? Why am I not It's It's not sustainable because yeah. you'll go through ebbs and flows in your life where mm. you can be super productive and then you can't be productive for the next couple of years because maybe you're having kids, you're prioritizing that, you're prioritizing a relationship, mm. you're prioritizing growing your family, you know, mm. or you're taking a sabbatical, mm. you're starting your own business, you're doing a startup or something like mm. that. And I think as, uh, you know, as young people as well, we put a lot of that pressure on ourselves. Yeah. And the, the, I think the most important thing is to really not get into a space, a very dangerous space where we try and compare ourselves to each other. Yeah. Hmm. Very profound. I mean, it's difficult to put into practice, uh, but it is very good advice. Um, so tell us about Singapore. Singapore. <laughs> wow. So two years of my life in this amazing and very hot and humid <laughs> city. Well, this is a city, country, actually, mm. but it feels like a city. That's why I say city, actually, because it felt so small. It kind of felt like a, like a smaller version of Durban, in a way. Yeah. But uh, it's such an amazing place, really. It's a funny story, again, of how I got there, right? Because previous, obviously, coming from the environment that it came from, mm. right? Uh, but sheltered, obviously, with the, with the t- t- circumstances mm. that I grew up. But at the same time, really not much exposure to other cultures, right? Yeah. Public schooling, black and Indian kids only in that school. So very comfortable. Brown yeah. and black kids, very, very comfortable. Mm. White kids, not maybe so much, yeah? Mm. So now there are opportunities. Obviously, the working style, the, the level of performance that I was del- delivering, Unilever then said, uh, here's an opportunity for you. Are you keen on an assignment? And I was like... Actually, I said no in the beginning. Really? I did say no in the beginning. I said, oh, I wasn't, I'm wasn't. i not quite sure at that point in time. Uh, again, it's probably my own An limitations, my own boundaries. Yeah. As to, okay, how am I going to do this, you know? Um, so I had a, a, a yet another awesome line manager at that point in time. So shout out to Naeem Adam. <laughs> Naeem Adam. He was a previous mentor of mine. So you were telling us about uh, Naeem Adam, the yeah, so <laughs> wonderful boss. Yeah, so Naeem actually said, pretty sure you should go. Mm. You, you don't get many opportunities like yeah. this in your life. I can't lifetime. believe it was even a consideration for you not to go. But you can understand the mindset, right? Yeah. I mean, being a sheltered mindset, mm. not too much exposure to other, other cultures. Mm. The first time really I'm getting that now, not even in university, but within a working environment. Mm. So there, there was a bit of anxiety yeah. around that. But um, at that point in time, he said, go for it. And I, you know, I really, uh, I took his guidance very strongly. And I said, I'm going. Were you already a manager at this point? No, I was not a manager. I was okay. still, I was still, uh, call it an analyst at that point in time. Yeah. But I knew what you were going to say. <laughs> 
uh, yeah, I was still an analyst at that point in time. But um, look, I'd never gone out of the country. Mm. I'd never gone on a holiday. Yeah. There was no money to do those yeah. kind of things, right? Yeah. So it was a literally a luxury. Never gone out of the country. So here I am deciding to go overseas. First time on an international flight ever. Mm. It's just a few years before I'd done a domestic flight for the first time. But here I am on, a, on an international You're flight. You're going all the way to Singapore. And I'm going to go there, stay there for like two years. Mm. So I didn't even realize myself what I was getting into yeah. until I was on the flight. Mm. And when I was in the flight, I broke down. Literally, really? I broke down. I was, I was so... Uh, like you're scared. I, I was... I was shocked first, hmm. and then I was like, "What have I done?" When I saw this map of the <laughs> of the world and what how far Durban is to Singapore, <laughs> but I really broke down in that moment. I said, "Okay, this is this is going to be a life defining moment." Yeah, for me. and yeah. it truly was a life defining moment. You yeah. know, it truly was in every way. I think from the work that I got to do, the people I got to meet, the the most amazing thing about it though was the mindset. Yeah. My mindset just grew phenomenally when yeah. I was in that space yeah. Yeah. because you're meeting so many different people. You're experiencing so many different things. You're learning from other cultures. You're become, becoming socially nuanced in terms of, yeah, you know, what are the characteristics, what to watch out for, what to be wary of. How do people engage? Exactly. How do they just... Yeah, yeah. how do they show empathy? Do they show empathy at all? Those kind of things, you know? But the mindset for me at that point in time was just like, wow, it yeah. was like all open, you know, but, um, and, and that's why I considered the life defining moment other than the fact that it was fun and I got to travel and, you know, I got to meet great people mm. at a good time, good and bad times as well, obviously with being away from family and stuff, yeah. but still a great time overall. Mm. But I think the mindset shift for me was the most important yeah. because the person that returned was not the person that left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way as well, I had a line manager, so shout out to Juliana. Um, I was still in Singapore actually, but she, within the first two months of me getting there, asked me to resign in South Africa and join Singapore actually. Really? And take up a, a job that was happening at that point in time. And obviously with me being so new. I mean, you didn't even want to go there. I, did, I was like crying on the flight and yeah, I'm, I'm two months in, I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to survive? Uh, more mm. and I was I was really unsure so yeah. she was so supportive though she 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 set up an opportunity for me to continue to be a manager mm. but continue to report into South Africa so mm. I didn't have to resign formally in South Africa for that and I thought you know in my you I got think, promoted in Singapore yes I got promoted wow. in Singapore I didn't know that I got promoted mm. in Singapore and I mean two months into this job yeah mm. and I didn't even think it was going to be possible at all so that is insane. I went for the opportunity. I was completely not prepared to be now manager of a foreign t team, literally a foreign team. One uh, lady from Vietnam, another guy from India, um, and a whole bunch of uh, you know foreign nationals in the office now working, partnering them on a daily basis. But this job was just uh, amazing. I mean, mm. and she was amazing because mm. for the first time, actually, I actually questioned myself: What did she see? Yeah. I, I what did she see? I, I I you know, in preparing for the conversation with you as well, I, I thought about it again. I said because at that point in time she just offered me the job. Two yeah. months of observation. Here you are doubting yourself and someone is like Exactly. It was for me actually in that moment she she taught me so much, I think. She mm. taught me a lot about my own self worth and that you don't have to rely on somebody else mm. to, to, to recognize to recognize you. your self worth. Mm. She didn't have to say anything. She literally, she didn't, didn't love bomb me in any way to tell me, oh, you're amazing, that kind of thing. She never did. She's a very amazing woman. Mm. She's a very straightforward woman as well, very strong leader. But she literally just said, you're good at this. I've observed you. Let's that do it, amazing. you know? So uh, for me as well, that was a mental block. It was the first time that actually I thought, that was a moment that said, okay, maybe I could be something else. Yeah. I could be something better. That was the better. That was a moment. She did that for me. Wow, you know? that's amazing. And that's what it takes, actually. Mm. Another woman believing mm. in you. And they don't have to believe in you and be all huggy and things like that. But they do need to... You Say know, something affirming. Exactly. Mm. That small affirmation and that movement to support and help lend a hand. Literally, she reached down and she pulled me up. Mm. In, in my head, that's how I see it, you mm. know. In that moment, she she's changed the course of my life yeah. for the next um, next few years. So I'm very grateful for her for doing that, you know, for me as well. 
But I mean, outside of that, I got to do um, a global brand uh, finance lead role uh, across many countries, China, US, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, got to do a, amazing launches, e-commerce. Mm. I love, that's where my love yeah, for digital yeah, really came from. <laughs> so I came back with all of these fancy ideas and everybody in South Africa was telling me, no, we're not there yet, you have mm. to wait. I'm like, but China is there, China is there. And they're like, no, you have to, um, you have to go back to, to doing what we're currently doing. Mm. We'll get there eventually, which is true. We will get there eventually as a market, as a country as well. But really, I mean, that's where the initial sparks of, um, I can you know, be someone. Yeah. I am someone, actually. I, I am somebody already. Mm. You feel mm. actually worthy at yeah. that point in time. Uh, she recognized it, but actually I realized at that point I probably needed to recognize it in myself as well. Yeah. So Tell us about um, the differences in culture, if yeah. any, um, and how it's like working in Singapore. Well, the, the cultural nuances are uh, different. I mean, there are lots of cultures, firstly. It's an mm. expat space, so yeah. you meet a lot of different people from a lot of different countries. Mm. Um, and they're all there with the same kind of ambition, work hard, play hard type of vibe. Um, so we really worked hard, but at the same time, it was really fun. You know, yeah. we got to do yeah. a lot of yeah. uh, fun things together. And the kind of cultural nuance is that, you know, you don't just, be, you're not just friends at the office. Yeah. In South Africa, sometimes it does become an office friend versus a, a, a life house, friend. Life friend, <laughs> exactly. So I got to meet a lot of people who are now my friends for life, which I, I really appreciate, mm. you know, having met them. I can, I can walk into or fly into a, a, another country and I would have a friend there from somewhere in this, in yeah. this t- tenure and a good friend, you know, mm. somebody I could really have a heart to heart conversation. And I'm uh, very appreciative for that. But, the, you know, the cultural nuances are so different. South mm. Africans, we are extremely, uh, we're very chatty mm. and we're very, um, we're very fam- uh, family orientated in a sense. Mm. We really want to know each other. Yeah. yeah. We really want to be we're relational uh, beings. Exactly. We know we're inquisitive about each other. You know, we're very friendly. Mm. Um, and we, we want to know what your life is about, you know, so almost the first two questions you always get asked is, what do you do? And are you married? Yeah. (laughs) So, I mean, outside of that, a Singaporean and the culture was so different. Nobody asked me that. (laughs) Nobody cared what my title was, firstly. Mm. Um, you know, they wasn't so, I I thought I, in my original days when I got there, obviously being only uh, within South Africa, I thought it was a little bit of rudeness. I mm, thought it was mm, so mm. because they never asked like me. Why are you so cold? Of, Engage they, me. Exactly. They didn't mm. ask me those kind of inquisitive questions in a way, which I was very used to, you know, mm. being prepped to kind of answer this whenever you met a new person. But, um, but in that way, I actually understood that they have a respect for people. Yeah. They respect their privacy. Mm. So if you share, you share what you feel comfortable sharing. But that boundary exists. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was quite an imprint on me as well. Mm. Because in my own right, that means that how I engage with people, you got to be conscious of that. Yeah. The other thing that was very funny, I always remember it, um, is that one of the, the colleagues at the time, they were a group of South Africans. And that's the thing about South Africans, right? We love our country. Yeah. Whatever, you know, whatever people tell you, we leave the country, all those kind of things. We love our country. Mm. When you go overseas, you will always find Gravitate a group towards of South Africans. Yeah. So you find your own little South Africa wherever mm. you are. And that's exactly what happened, right? I, we had a group of South Africans, even in the office, even outside of the office, um, that we always hung out together. Along with cross, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, uh, foreign nationalities as well. So, I mean, the South African experience um, there and the cultural experience uh, there within Singapore was, in, in my mind, uh, by the time two years had finished, it was a cultural explosion in my mind. Mm. And it, it really elevated me as a person, just yeah. in terms of how my interpersonal skills now grew. Yeah. You know? And that, that, for me, was a, a big moment. So now towards the end of the two years, uh, did you consider staying on longer? Um, and what was the driving force behind yeah. you eventually coming back to South Africa? Yeah, I did consider it. Mm. It was an option. But I, I no, would, you weren't scared. <laughs> I wasn't scared. I was loving it at that point. So really the scared part was coming back home to South Africa, you know. Mm. Um, but no, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, I had another opportunity to come back. Uh, it was a good opportunity. But I also felt it was time to give back to my, my people, yeah. you know, my family, um, 
they'd been without me for a couple of years. Um, so I came back to the job um, and the family uh, element, but I don't regret it. Yeah, yeah. It's not a decision I regret. Mm. Uh, probably in the first couple of years, I was uh, unsure about that decision because obviously you're uh, back with dealing with safety issues, mm. cr- uh, crime, mm. whereas life was very easy, right? Um, in, a, in a no crime space. Living easy. Yeah. Mm. But here you're worried about you know taxis swiping you on the road, that kind mm. of thing. So... Um, it was stressful when I did the comparison. Well, mm. Why is it some people, again, have a great life and they get to live in an amazing country? Mm. And in South Africa, we pay so much tax that we, we struggle to enjoy even the basic, yeah. basic amenities, you yeah. know? So that, that kind of mental work as well, it played on me because mm. I now I had a real world example as a benchmark, what yeah, it could be. be like. But what we are living like is very different. Yeah. So that took me a little while to get over as well. But Mm. I mean, I've never regretted it to an extent um, because I think in a way, the work that I had uh, that was coming before me was so invigorating, you know, Mm. and of course, having my family while I do this invigorating work was super, super helpful. Look at you, all family oriented. I am a family oriented. (laughs) True South African. (laughs) Um, And then you made the decision to... um, move out of the finance function, yeah. your home. What prompted that? What was your thinking? Yeah, it was a, it was a scary time because I decided to move into sales. Mm. I literally moved into sales function at that point in time. And it's, uh, you know, anybody who's been in sales, extremely male-dominated. Yeah. yeah extremely yeah. male-dominated. Yeah. Um, and for me, I think the decision criteria was more around what would I gain from the experience. Mm. I'm not a conventional finance partner, if mm. I could say that. I'm a problem solver. So you asked me about the arts and things like that, right? How do I get to apply that? I get to apply that by being able to, to f- solve, solve problems in a very unique way. Mm. So I apply it almost every single day in my job. Actually, recently, um, one of my colleagues asked me that as well. He said, how are you a finance partner? You are so all-rounded. Mm. And I said, actually, I, that's, that's what I love. Mm. I, I don't want to actually be the finance person that rears her head when there's a number being spoken. Mm. I love the operations. I love talking about business and how to grow people, how to grow brands, mm. how to make you know, everyday kind of healthcare accessible to ev- every single South African. Mm. I love talking about this stuff. So as a result, I make it my job, mm. literally, I'm also very interested in it, but I make it my job to know what's happening around, you know, yeah. in the market, yeah. within the industry, within other functions as well. So I've always kind of had that innate interest. Yeah. So doing the sales job, obviously I'd lose the, the finance function for a period of years, actually at that point in time, but it was, a, it was an opportunity to again have a different exposure. Mm. And I would, I would remark that any person who has this opportunity should take it, yeah. in my own opinion, because it makes you a stronger professional. Yeah. I came back to the function. Yeah. There was opportunities, obviously, for me to not come back into finance. Did function. you intend, when you first left, did you think, I'm making a permanent move across? No. Or you always knew that you'd yeah. come back? I knew I'd come back at some point. Okay. You know, I was doing it for, again, the mindset, yeah. being able to broaden the skill, uh, skill base. You can keep sh- uh, sharpening your sword mm. um, in in your profession, yeah. Mm. But in a way, it gives you a very niche. Yeah. It becomes very An niche, edge. and you don't really get that that kind of operational business, bigger business hat mm. kind of experience. Mm. You only get that actually if you go in one of the core functions, a marketing fun- uh, function or a sales function. So I went into sales, um, a very interesting yeah. uh, interesting space. I worked on big data Mm. uh, at that point in time, so to doing that uh, gender, net revenue management as well, so how to grow different channels, make the best out of those promotions that come out of there. Um, And I also ran the digital strategy. Mm. So I was responsible for rolling out new transformation processes, transformation the sales function in totality, Mm. and also working on digital solutions like um, RPA, robot pro- process automation, um, uh, technology enhancements, mm. being able to use tools like Power BI, Tableau mm. for reporting requirements, mm. cloud infrastructure, those kind of things. So I developed real interest in that. You yeah. know? At that yeah. point in time, I was so interested in, uh, and I still to date maintain that. You know, it's a, it was an extremely fun role. Yeah. But oddly enough, they didn't hire me for that. 
And mm. I, I always use that example because they actually hired me for the big data, the NRM, the, the net revenue management. They wanted me with my financial expertise to help land some controls, mm. make sure the money was being spent in the right spaces. Mm. So why else would they take a finance person yeah. in that role, right? <laughs> you could get a sales guy to do that. Mm. Um, but they wanted me because I could count the rands and cents, so to speak, and keep the line. But what I had transformed it into by taking on, seeing there were so many gaps within operations, that the sales guys couldn't get their jobs done because they had to focus on all of these other pieces at the same time. I had an opportunity and I, I just took it. I mm. saw there's an opportunity for a digital transformation. And that's the thing, right? Opportunity is there. And it's mm. a limited window for that mm. before it becomes at a disadvantage. Mm. And organizations need to get to a point where they, they understand the balance of that. Because you could either be leading or lagging. There's, yeah. there's yeah. kind of no in between. Yeah? Mm. At this point in time, um, and interestingly in South Africa, a lot of organizations are lagging in, yeah. when it comes to digital operations. Now with COVID onset, we've had to transform a lot yeah. more faster. Yeah. But at that point in time, no COVID, there was such an opportunity to just free people up, yeah. you know, free people up from the mundane, the parts of the job that everybody hates, you know, but nobody says anything because it's, hey, who else is going to do it? Yeah. Um, the opportunity to bring in new roles that are not even in the industry as yet, you know, to make those roles. Um, we, I saw a massive opportunity for that. So I pitched it at that point in time and it sold. So did you, were you approached for the opportunity or did you just say, this is the gap that I'm seeing, this is the vision yeah. that I have, give me the opportunity. Yeah. I, I, you push yourself forward for it. Yeah, so I said, this is the gap. Mm. Um, and I said, these are the things we can be doing. Look at what the industry is at, you mm. know, where the industry is at. And th that, that's where I'm also very grateful for the organization that I was in. Very rarely do you have... Um, an opportunity to where you propose something and literally it's embraced. It's all, all embraced, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you will support you. Yeah. If you think it's if it's worth it, we'll go after it. Yeah. Um, but they, they did that, you know, they really open open mindedly to a non director at the time as well to say, Hey, we're open to, we're open to that. And it was an amazing experience. Mm. I got to learn so much. Imagine outside of finance, and, and it's a challenge, right? When you're, a, when you're a finance professional, you generally speak about income statement, balance sheet, controls. That's the kind of basics. Uh, operations doesn't feature much in there. Mm. Yeah, and this, that's kind of left to your marketeers, your sales, your GMs in a way. But the the value that can be had by mm. having those kind of conversations irrespective of whether you're in the function or not mm. is is so much more valuable yeah so by just you know managing that program at that point in time leading the transformation agenda even the hr strategy mm. it was something that mm. i had um mm. you know had a hand on and transforming now what are all these new roles going to be called yeah. what is a new organization going to look like um having just to manage that entire end-to-end -end transformation, not just the operations coming out, but literally put in the, um, the structure for that, the organization for that, do the recruitment for that as yeah. well. All of that, literally. Holistic. Unbelievable experience, mm. really unbelievable experience, which is why I say you've got to grab opportunities. Yeah. You've got to see the opportunity and make it as mm. well. Not, not every single time an opportunity looks like somebody offering you a job. Yeah. You've got to be careful of that, right? Yeah. But if you see a gap, you got to be able to offer yourself up for that. Yeah. And that's the way you progress. Mm. Yeah. I, it's always been my, my routine. It's probably one of the reasons why I've done well in my career yeah. as well. Is because I've been able to spot a gap and I haven't been afraid to put myself in a position that says, hey, I'm willing to, or to also solve it for you. Yeah. I'm linking it to the conversation we're having on self-belief um, and self-worth. Like if you hadn't come to that realization that I am somebody, the contribution that I'm making is valuable, you wouldn't even think that your idea is worth pitching mm. or that they're going to lend an ear, Absolutely. you know, to that conversation. So it ties into not just, we speak of it like it's a soft thing, but it can actually affect how you show up in your career Absolutely. and the success you're able to have because you've put yourself forward for those opportunities. Yeah, the confidence, you know, often people think things and they don't say it. Mm. In my case, by that stage, I'd raised such a level of confidence on my craft because I knew it, right? Yeah. I may be an introvert, you know, in my personal space, 
But within my professional space, I'm great at what I do. I so. I know my stuff. Mm. You know, I put effort into knowing that. I don't mm. just know it. I mm. put I dedicate a lot of time and effort into making sure that I I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So that then gave me also the confidence, you know, to be able to say, hey, I this is an opportunity, and I see you have no one to do it. I'm willing to offer my services. Wow. And that really, I think, will serve everybody. Um, you know, I've always used that as a mentoring example when I mentor as well. Is it's really a way of life ultimately because opportunities you're going to have to opportunities are not always a new job. Mm. They, they are, there are ways in your existing jobs as well to make it more exciting. Yeah. The most, you know, sometimes the most frustrating thing for me is when somebody tells me I'm bored in my job. Mm. If you're bored in your job, then you know you also not. You're also part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. Because there's so much more anyone could do. My yeah. mantra is always: I never leave a job in the same way I found it. Mm. I never, because mm. I want to be able to leave a, an, an impact. impact. Yeah, I want to impact the people. I want to yeah. impact the space. So I'm very, I'm, I'm very committed in that case that I want to be able to make an impact before I move on to the whatever next opportunity. It is that comes or, back. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's quite admirable. Um, and then you came back into the finance, finance function. Um, and it's actually so weird how it's almost like the dots were connecting. Um, even when you mentioned that you initially moved out of finance into a sales role, uh, I thought about your car polish days, uh, <laughs> even though it's not the same kind of sales, it was more strategy this time around. Um, and then coming back into the finance function and partnering sales mm. post essentially working with the team to create that sales organization. Yeah. Mm. So how was that? It, w- it was fun. I mean, it was really good. I missed a little bit of the digital because obviously running this, this space that was so out of the box and so cutting edge mm. that became um, a- an opportunity for me to how, t- how do I continue to cultivate that outside, yeah. um, outside of just my you know my my job so to speak but mm. to continue to keep that light burning because mm. it's a it's a it's a big interest for me and continues to be today but um it was a lot more easier as well i mean mm. i had this impact with these leaders when i now had to to be their finance partner i found the influencing a lot more yeah easier. you've already built the rapport yeah, you've shown absolutely. what you can do so yeah. i found it a lot more easier i got to meet and work with great people <laughs> like you <laughs> Uh, the gre- it was one of the best teams as well. I've had an opportunity to lead a lot of teams, uh, but that team um, within the, the finance space really always I know. has a it has a, a, a the lasting thing. Heart, mm. Yeah, so I mean, it was a it was a good time. I think in finance, I also found in a way the job easier. Mm. Yeah, because at that point, I'd already started. I'd gotten through all those kind of self-esteem challenges as mm, well, you know. Mm, mm. I felt that hey, I'm now in a position where actually I, I, I'm capable. I feel like I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm good enough, you know. I don't need to prove anything any longer, mm. you know. I've made it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, it's bad because you don't really want to rely on a on a title for that. Mm. I I didn't in that case in that point in my time. I was very very satisfied with what I've been able to achieve as a person, mm. not just because I had made director. Mm. I was more in, I was more into my own cultivating my own inner strength, yeah. so that I could be a you know better human mm. overall. You know, mm. better more empathetic person. Inner self actualization. Exactly. Yeah. So it kind of t- all timed out that the the kind of promotable uh, aspect also happened at the same time and became a director at that point in time but um, certainly that wasn't the the reason for the for the you know the satisfaction shall I say Mm. so how do you know um, of course it's not a blanket answer but in your own experience um, what has been the prompt to say okay now it's done you've partly answered it but now it's done um time to pursue the next opportunity um what is it that informs that for you i think the what what prompts the next move Mm. is one you've made an impact yeah you've done your time so to speak and also the fact that opportunity doesn't strike twice so if it's a really good opportunity yeah you got to be able to take it and that's case in point what happened to me right when i was headhunted um yeah, that that is exactly what happened when I got headhunted for the the head of finance role. Mm. I wasn't expecting it, guys. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. You mm. know, I was very happy. I've had all of this amazing growth with this amazing organization, which I have a, still a lot of love for, 
and all of the people that mm. I got to meet, right? Mm. Like friends and family for life. Mm. Um, but here, here I am now, this huge opportunity, yeah. much huge, you know, massive leap, still relatively young. Um, yeah, I can't remember how old I was, 34 at that point in time. Maybe a bit younger, actually. <laughs> <laughs> to be um, heading up an entire organization. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but it was a leap of faith for me, which I said, if I'm not going to do it now, I probably wouldn't do it. And again, I said, now or never. I got to trust my, I got to trust the, the moment, the opportunity. And I just leaped. Trust the moment. Wow. What an interesting journey. I'm sure uh, the thousands of you who watch this channel <laughs> have learned a lot. Uh, Pranisha is very driven. Um, good head on her shoulders, so to speak. Um, you can see how she approached even the decisions that she's made um, in her career, how she wanted to make an impact, how to plan the next move, essentially. So I've learned a lot from her, not just in the time that she was my line manager, but in general, in the time that I've known her. So very good journey from a career perspective. Um, you've shared that you're also quite passionate about travel. Uh, what are some of the things that fuel you um, outside of work? Mm. Yeah, I think the the things that fuel me is really the, the give back part of it now. Yeah. I think, um, you know, what keeps me in the job as well is, is interesting. The part that I love most about the job, actually, is the impact I get to make on people's lives. Yeah. The mentoring. Yeah. I, yeah. That is the best part of the job. And yeah. I've mentored so many people. I continue to mentor both women and men. Mm. And the ability to help them, you know, growing up as well, you didn't have a role model. Yeah. There was no role yeah. model. Yeah. There was no yeah. one within your circle who, for me, certainly, there's no one that ever, ever, you know, followed this path. This path. Yeah. No one, literally. Mm. So who do you ask for? You know, mm. when you see the subtle biases or you finally recognize it, when you see the prejudice, you see, uh, you know, the emo emotional kind of tra trauma and turmoil that goes with that. Who do, you, who do you actually turn on? There is no one to turn on. Mm. And I always remember that because there have been many moments, mm. you know, crying in toilets, board meetings, uh, you know, uh, being able to, you know, how do you say it, like have uh, emotional connections yeah. in a way. But all of these moments, they, they mean something. Yeah. They mean something yeah. to me because it was a hard journey, you know, mm. not having somebody to lean on um, it's challenging. I've had great people, great line managers, you know, um, Philip Sass is one of them mm. is really, uh, you know, second time supporter. is getting a shout out in this channel. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, he's an amazing friend. I would call him a brother by now, mm. um, but still continues to be a massive support. But I mean, outside of you know, people who like me, mm. you know, people who've experienced the same things I have experienced, mm. a lot of those leaders didn't quite understand it, right? Yeah. So they would help on the job, they would help provide direction, mm. but they wouldn't help the inner the stuff. The journeys have been so different. Absolutely. Yeah. They wouldn't help the inner stuff. So I think, you know, my role now is really about paying that back yeah. and, and helping reaching down and lending a hand and pulling other people up. Yeah. You got to do that, you yeah. know, and I, I really challenge every single leader. Mm. If you're not doing that, make that your number one goal. Yeah. Because yeah. your job at this point in time is really not only about delivering the deliverables. Yeah. That can happen. Mm. I'm a very goal driven person. I'm a very performance mm. driven person. Mm. I continue to keep that happening. But I want to be able to bring people with me. Yeah. I want to say by the time I retired that I created this many leaders, you mm. know. Yeah. That is the person I want to be. Mm. Outside of the job, I really, the sexy title can go tomorrow. Mm. But that, that Pranisha, mm. who's the empathetic person that continues to help people, that continues to tell people that they're more than, than just what they are, you know, where mm. they come from, mm. their title, mm. their kind of job status, mm. their relationship status. <laughs> More than all or of like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I want to be able to be that person. So yeah. I that that I mean the the kind of uh, support that I lend on that that continues to be my. That's uh, the legacy you want. That's leave. the legacy. And if, mm. if I talk about purpose, mm. that's the purpose for me. Yeah, I want to be able to be that support that I lacked. Yeah that I see is required yeah that unfortunately not many people are vulnerable enough to talk about yeah so yeah beautiful uh any closing remarks 
Thank you very much. This was fun. I'm <laughs> very know. excited to have been here with you. And I, I really hope that my small story, hopefully small, <laughs> <laughs> has helped you. Uh, you know, and of course, I mean, I'm very happy to mentor as well. So if anybody wants to directly contact me, you can contact me by Palesa, her page. I'm very happy to continue to support both women and men, both mm. welcome, um, and lend my support in whichever way I can. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, I will link Pranisha's LinkedIn um, link um, at the bottom uh, in the description box. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed the conversation, that you learned a lot from her. I certainly have and continue to do so. Um, And I hope that it's inspired someone to say, I can be something. I am something already. Um, And just reigniting that self-belief. I feel like it's a journey of self-belief more than just progression Mm, in your career. Uh, Very beautifully articulated story. Thanks for joining me on my channel. I will see you guys on the next video. Bye. Bye.